Hey everybody, welcome to the Sunken Library Guide by Krog2003. I wanted to make this guide because there's just not a lot of resources online regarding this fight. And it's one of my favorite fights in the game. It's very unique, it's got a cool pace to it. The preparation I think is pretty easy to do with uh, fairly easy to attain brothers. Um, and there's definitely been an increase in popularity in this game. The uh, the completion percentage of this, according to the global achievements on Steam at the time of making this, is 2%. To compare that to the Kraken, which is 2.1%, which I don't think is the greatest fight in the game. It definitely needs some love. The Monolith at 3.1%, which many people regard as kind of their end game fight that like you could cap a run off with. I think that's a pretty fun way to play the game as well. And the Ezerok, which is at 5.1%, which I'm actually kind of surprised it's that low. Um, I think that this is probably the third uh, easiest, if you will, legendary fight with the Ezerok and the Icy Cave before it. Um, I actually struggle with the Witch Hut a bit, but some people might say the Witch Hut is easier than this. Um, so I want to make this guide so that folks that are new... Uh, folks that are veterans that may be, you know, hesitant to take this fight, give it a try um, and really boost this percentage uh, to complete it. I think you can do it fairly early, depending on your play style. Uh, there is a turtle fight. He is a great Battle Brothers resource and player. Uh, he uh, has a video of it being done at day 58. I'm going to link some other uh, fights that I've seen on YouTube in the description. Um, there's not a lot. And then I'm also going to have the raw footage where I'll comment what I do, uh, attached as well. It's a longer fight, so not everyone's going to want to have the patience to sit through it, but I'll narrate, I'll color commentate, I'll criticize my own mistakes. Overall, that one was my anatomist playthrough recently and it went very smoothly. But I took that fight at day 109. I did a playthrough that I wanted to record this fight for this video for, with a poacher run at day 98. But the company was a little weaker than that anatomist one. Unfortunately, I saved over that save like an idiot, so I lost it. But you can take this fairly early. The preparation isn't too bad. And you can really snowball with the resources too. And they're the resources you get from this fight are are very interesting to you. You get solid loot, first off. You get the black book, which you need to have either a level 2 historian or a level 9 cultist in your party. Over time, you'll get an event that will make that person mad. They'll read the black book. You don't want to sell the black book if that's a, you know, pretty obvious. And then once they become mad, there's another event that can trigger that's got a pretty good probability of triggering where that person trades the black book to this dude and that dude gives you three options. Option one is 50,000 gold. I would recommend not doing that unless, you know, that's your thing. You can totally use that to buy some good gear. Um, I'd recommend the other two. They're just a bit more fun. And I really like the rewards. Reward that one uh, is the... The Gilder's Embrace Shield. I really like this item. This is the most powerful item, I think, in the game. Uh, you can really do some good stuff with a with a Lone Wolf build style tank. You could use that guy in Barbarian, Orc, and Monolith, and Ancient Dead fights. He's super powerful. Um, there are probably other guides out there. I could even showcase some fights where I use that. And people care. And then the other one is my favorite. I think it's super fun, which is getting the two jars that add an extra perk point to a brother. So this lets you kind of pick your two favorite brothers or favorite brother and really make him into something interesting and special because you can add an extra two perks on there. Kind of luxury, nice to have perks. Um, and I think that's very fun. So the rewards for this fight are also very good and attainable. And honestly, the earlier you take this fight, the you know sooner you'll get those events and hopefully have a uh, a fun run. So I think um, you know if you're a fast player, you could probably take this fight in day 70s, you know day 50s if you're really 
one of these speedrunner elites. Or like me, I think I'm I have a decent pace and I like to try to look to take this fight in day 90 to day 110 depending upon what I'm futzing around with in the campaign. But let's get the completion percentage up and uh, we'll get into some of the other bits of the guides. As I started off with, this is a pretty unique fight. So let's kind of go over a basic overview of it so you kind of know what to expect. The The main bad guy here is the Lore Master. The Lore Master is kind of a Voldemort-like lich where he's got all these different jars or phylactopies, I think that's how you pronounce it, which are like his horcruxes if you're a Harry Potter fan. So basically... If you kill him, he revives into one of these jars. So he kind of tries to make himself immortal. In order to win this fight, you have to kill everything in the map like a normal fight. Uh, but the, the gimmick here is that the lore master can resurrect up to 10 times if you kill none of his jars. By then, I think the fight will be out of your control and you'll probably lose. The... The next thing is you're in a kind of unique map. The map, you will generally play the entire map. Most fights, you start in the middle of the map, and you kind of fight in the middle of the map. Maybe you fall back. Maybe you pursue some guys. Maybe you use some terrain. But rarely do you use the entire map. This is one of those unique fights where you use the entire map. You are on sand. There are lots of obstacles. That can be both good and bad. The obstacles are random. The jars themselves are going to be placed around the map. There will be 10 of them. We'll kind of go into more detail in the strategy section of this. The fight overall, in my opinion, is a bit of an endurance fight. It takes a while to play it. Even some of the faster ones I've seen on YouTube are 30 minutes to you know, 45 minutes. The, the run that I did... Uh, the raw footage for this one is about 50 minutes to an hour. The ancient undead will bog you down with their shields. They're meant to kind of hold you as this fight slowly escalates. And if you don't deal with that properly, it's going to escalate out of your control. Also, the lore master is like an ancient priest on steroids. He'll, we'll get into more detail on him specifically, but he's gonna hit you with a lot of morale checks. And then also the fearsome from all the enemies down there, it slowly whittles down the overall morale of your party. Generally, your party is going to have to split up to, to deal with this fight and prevent it from getting out of hand. So it's hard to keep everybody around that banner and keep their morale up. So I think it, in a way, it drains your morale. Um, it also drains your stam with all of the sand. There's some ways to mitigate that as well. I think that's easier to deal with than the morale. But the, the morale one is kind of sneaky. I've had some where things are going really well and guys will just start to lose their morale and I'll fall behind in the fight and it gets a little, little spicy. The... The thing too with this fight is there's just a lot of little paper cuts. They'll start to, the skulls will start to damage you. And at first you're like, whatever, it doesn't do much to my armor. But then your armor will slowly start to wither away. Some of the ancient undead, they'll come back. They'll they'll chip away at your armor, at your hit points. The miasma will start to chip away at your hit points. And as I said, it really starts to get kind of out of your control around like, day 15 or turn to 15 to turn 20 if you're not careful um, but if you manage these things and you prepare for them a little bit you'll be in good shape this fight does need patience you don't want to get behind in the morale and the stam game um, but you also need to be deliberate and there are points in this fight where you turn it on from an endurance kind of fight to a sprint where you got to make shit happen and win the fight and if you're if you get that timing kind of right, you can um, you can crush this fight, and it's really no factor. All right, so let's get into the enemies. First up, we have the ancient honor guards. These guys are pretty familiar. You've seen them before. They have lots of armor. They have pretty fragile hit points. They're resistant to pierce. You know there are a lot of good guides out there on how to fight ancient undead. 
Um, you know what to expect. Things with good armor penetration are good against these guys. You know, great axe, rusty barbarian axe, two-hand mace, duelist, two-hand hammer, all the good stuff. Sneaky good weapon now is the two-handed flail with that extra armor pen against the headshot. You can do some pretty good hit point damage to them. They still have steel brow, so you don't get the critical, but you get to sneak through some extra hit point damage. Um, according to the wiki, you have four that always spawn with pole arms and then eight other ones for 12 total. The I've seen kind of a bunch of different ones. So like the eight honor guards, I think it's kind of random what they spawn with. My least favorite is the ones that spawn with shields because they just slow down uh, the main part of your your push to get to the get the kind of initial stage under control, get on the lore keeper and start whittling them down. The more interesting things about the ancient honor guards that I've seen um, are their AI tendencies are a little different. Um, they will aggressively protect the lore master and they will also aggressively protect the jars. The jars, it's not as big of a deal, but when I was testing, I have noticed that like, if I put a guy next to him, like an honor guard will run over with the shield and try to shield bash you away. So take that as a little nugget. You might be able to take advantage of the AI a bit, get them to peel off from that main group and waste their turn. Like a shield bash against you is a is a waste of their AP. They'll also do the same thing with the lore master, which they'll do some rotate to try to get him out of danger. They'll shield bash you. They'll do some they'll do some strange things that you can take advantage of in certain situations to try to get them to waste their AP. For instance, if your main target is one of the bodyguards, because I think there's usually five or six that hang around the lore master, you can put the lore master in danger and some guy will spend his AP to rotate the lore master and he won't be hitting you. So that's nice with some of their two-handed cleavers or their two-handed uh, swords. Um, it's just four AP less or three, but it, it, it screws up their cadence and... Um, it's one of these little things that you can use against the AI to save AP on your to on your side, but waste it on there. So if you move up next to the lore master with a two-hander, you still have seven or three or six, depending on if you have Pathfinder or not. And then they'll move their guys around to try to, to deal with that and get the lore master out. So then you can smack the guy you really want. Um, it can be pretty nice to take advantage of at certain spots. So just pay attention to that, that the ancient dead are really going to prioritize protecting the lore master and protecting the jars. Next up for enemies, we have the lost treasure hunters. There's always three of them and they always spawn with top tier weapons, either the sham shear, the Southern mace, the scimitar, maybe a fighting spear. I don't think I've ever seen that, but regardless, you're either going to get, double gripping strong weapons or the scimitar. These guys are sneaky dangerous. I would argue that they're even more dangerous than some of the honor guard. Um, they have 85 attack from what I can see. They have five melee defense from what I can see. They have 180 hit points. It's no joke to deal with. And they have enough AP to hit you twice. So they have eight or nine and Pathfinder. I don't know. They're there's no entry on the uh, Wikipedia for them. Um, they also do have Steel Brow from what I've seen, and they might have Duelist. These guys will, they look like regular zombies, so you might take them lightly. They will get up on your guys, and they will hit them. Um, they have Fearsome, and they do a lot of damage. They can really sidebar your fight early on. If you're not careful with these guys, they can do a lot of armor and hit point damage right off the bat, potentially killing a guy. We'll get into the details of the mass resurrection mechanic, but these guys, I would recommend having a plan to pick their weapons up, potentially. Just getting that scimitar or that two-handed southern mace out of the fight 
and trading that for a pole arm that they'll spawn with if they have no weapon is super critical because that two-handed southern mace will do a lot of damage and waste your fatigue pool and that two-handed scimitar will hurt like a bastard the sham shear is less of a threat than the other two but i think they have duelists so it will do damage to you one last thing to note with these guys is i noticed they do not have steel brow which is nice if you can take advantage of that you will do critical damage on headshots to these guys as Take advantage of that if you have brothers with increased headshot chance, weapons that have increased headshot chance, or a headhunter um, brother. You can put these guys down a little faster. You do want to prioritize and have a plan for these guys early on. Finally, we have the star of the show, the lore keeper. He is a pain in the butt. He is the main baddie of this fight, and you need to kill him to win this fight. I mean, that's pretty obvious. That's like John Madden when he used to say you need to score more points than the other team to win the game. Although he was one of my favorite commentators. Um, but yeah, the lore keeper, he has a, a big health pool. He, as far as I can tell, um, he has damage resistance to basically all damage. I tried hitting him with some pierce damage from spears. Uh, from some two-handed axes, from some two-handed hammers, uh, two-handed mace, um, just to kind of see. I did a bunch of different save and plays, and every single time it looks like he took reduced damage from all those weapon types. Maybe he takes less reduced damage the less jars he had. It is noting that I did this testing with all 10 jars on the battlefield still. Um, once again, I don't no, there's just not a lot of information on the wiki specifically about this enemy. He has 15 melee defense from what I can see and underdog. Um, so he he does have a above average chance of dodging your hits. It is noticeable and can be annoying. Um, I'll get into this with the uh, the brothers and perks section. But Backstabber can be a nice to have if you have a brother that you're looking to dismiss, but he's good enough to take into the library. Maybe you give him back, uh, Backstabber specifically for this fight and dismiss him after or if he dies, whatever. The Lore Master's primary strategy is to just cast spells at you. Uh, from what I can tell, he can cast up to three spells per turn. Um, and the spells that he casts vary throughout the fight. The first spell is uh, Miasma. That one's pretty standard with Ancient Priests. Makes a cloud and uh, does damage over time if you end your turn in it. Um, he can summon this from what I can see anywhere on the map. He generally will try to hit as many brothers with it as possible. It's just like another Ancient Priest fight. He also has his Fear spell. Um, this is the one that he uses to damage your morale, make your brothers panic and lose their turn etc. This one is a pain because it can be cast around the entire map. I've had him hit my brothers that are up in his face or also go after my jar hunters that are off running around by themselves. This is his primarily primary way of damaging your morale. Um, he also around round six ish, maybe seven, he'll start to use summon skulls. This will spawn four skulls around the edge of the map we'll go into the skull specifically um but he'll use the he'll start using these pretty much every turn and uh, this is one of the ways to snowball uh the fight will snowball later in the fight um if you kill a certain amount of jars or i've seen it around round 13 so two ish jars three ish jars or around 13 14 15 he'll start to summon ghosts He'll summon two ghosts at a time. Um, we'll kind of go over the difference with these ghosts, but these ghosts will will spawn. They'll also spawn on the edge. You need to kill these uh, before you can win the win the match as well. Um, this is the last way this fight can really get kind of crazy. Is once you have a lot of ghosts and a lot of skulls running around, it can be dangerous. The Lord Keeper will also raise the dead. 
once uh, he gets enough of his jars dead or it gets late enough in the fight. I've seen this happen around turn 12. Uh, also earlier, if I've killed like three or four jars during testing. So start to be ready for that. Basically, he'll resurrect all the ancient undead or the treasure hunters um, with whatever health completely filled up, but their armor will still be destroyed. The thing to note here is that if their weapon either doesn't drop because like, you know, your loot chance or you pick up the weapons, they will always spawn with the war scythe. His last spell is his only offensive spell. Granted, it does massive damage. It's the lightning. So what it'll do is it'll mark a line of hexes north to south and the following turn, anything caught in that line will take massive damage. It will not damage his own guys though. So it will only hurt your brothers. So you can't really cheese it to take out his own undead guys. The lore master ghosts are more or less a dumbed down version of him. They do not resurrect to the jars. If you kill them, they just die. Their defenses are the same. They have a lot less hit points because they're a ghost. So it just takes one hit to kill them. You can hit them with ranged weapons, unlike Geist, for instance. So that is a viable way to kill them. They cast one spell per turn, and it seems to be a dumbed-down version. So they can cast Lightning. They can summon, I think, two Skulls. They can cast Wither, which basically hurts your fatigue pool and your initiative, I believe. Maybe your damage. Um, and they will also cast the Lightning spell. So the more of these guys... Um, the more things can get crazy. They also can resurrect one guy. They can't do a mass res, but a singular res. But if you start to get five or six of these things on the battlefield, it can become a real problem for you to handle. Next, we have the skulls. The skulls fly around and they try to suicide into your brothers. When they die, they damage everything around them, including friendly fire. So they can damage other skulls. They can damage undead. They can damage jars. Your shields do have a chance to block the damage, just like a regular hit, um, but you can't avoid it. So if it doesn't hit your shield, it will hit your armor. It has pretty bad armor damage and armor pen, but if your armor has gone, it'll, it'll chunk away at your hit points pretty good, especially if there's a bunch of these skulls around. Lastly, we have the jars. The jars themselves are fairly weak. Um, these are the things you're going to need to take out. They are resistant to piercing attacks like regular undead or ancient undead. Um, the ways that I like to kill them are throwing axes. Uh, we'll get into that with the strategy, but you can two shot them with ranged weapons that are piercing, unless you have like a really high damage bow or high roll, um, damage on it. The easiest way to do it is a heavy barb axe or a regular throwing axe. With my testing, they do one, they one shot the jar. Even if you're close, if you're not, doesn't matter. <clears throat> you can one shot them. You can also two or three shot them with a sling. So that is a little bit of a note um, for kind of a contingency plan to deal with these jars. The way that I'm going to do the brothers and perks section is highly recommend, nice to have, as in you should have them, but you don't necessarily need them, and luxury um, builds and perks. Because I think, honestly, they, you can totally make this harder on yourself or figure this out in numerous different ways without or with any of these. So that's kind of the beauty of the game is to kind of think unorthodoxly and depending on what you find for items to make it work. The first one are my highly recommended brothers and perks. The first one is a useful banner. I could make a video in and of itself on making a banner that's actually good. There are other players out there that kind of inspired me to start doing this, like Some Weird Sins. Um, the main example of this is a banner thrower. The one I took into this fight was a monk that had some stars in resolve. He had brave, so he had really good resolve. And then he had two stars in may or range attack. And only had like 79 range attack. And I didn't even take bags and belts with him. But what I did do was I took some heavy throwing spears and a, uh, a smoke pot just in case. And he also had high fatigue. 
This is one of the fights where using rally often to keep your guys out of wavering, especially if you're the anatomist because you can't have confident, is really powerful because the resolve can get chipped away by the lore keepers using fear all the time. <clears throat> so I would recommend having a banner that is beyond just the kind of banner whip. You could do that. I just don't think the whip is going to be that useful in this fight because you're going to use a lot of fatigue to disarm and it's kind of spotty and inconsistent. You're better off having some throwing because you can throw nets at a cheaper fatigue. You can throw grenades cheaper. I brought the spears, the throwing spears specifically to whittle down those treasure hunters fast. Um, and he had a very good fight. He had a lot of fatigue. He was able to keep my morale up. He was able to move around. I had... Um, quick hands on him so he could be very useful um, anyway I'll get off my high horse and having a useful banner you could also do this with like a banner tank a I've done this my um, I really wish I had that save but that save I used a dodge quick hands banner so he was a nimble dude with dodge with quick hands um, and with fearsome and he was pretty good I got him stuck in a little bit on some one-on-ones he did some good cleanup he kept the morale up uh overall very very solid in this fight the other one are thrower hybrids i think you need a minimum of two um and i use these as kind of my jar commandos i'll run these guys with i'll try to get to around 75 melee attack and 85 uh ranged attack and i go for hit points and resolve uh other people kind of do other things I you can bring bags and belts that'll be nice I and this run did not but I think you need minimum pathfinder you need quick hands and berserk is a real nice to have throwing mastery is of course a good thing I have fearsome on those so that's a dead perk in this fight so you don't need them perfect for this fight um, I think you need minimum of two to go deal with jars in the back. There's usually five or six back there and they can do a great job at managing skulls, managing ghosts and killing jars. I like to run them with axes, a sling and a goblin pike. We'll go into that more in the item prep, um, but you can kind of play with it. You want, you want a plan to deal with skulls and ghosts. You want a plan to deal with raised jars and then you kind of want to back up. Um, I ran four. I had two that I equipped with more damage weapons to once again help churn through some of the enemies and then peel off to some of the mid map jars. But I like four. Three is okay for me. Um, but I think I highly recommend at least two thrower hybrids. And um, once again, my benchmarks is I look for a guy with around 75 melee attack, 85 range attack after gifted for instance i'll show him at some point i brought a like a, a coward gambler that i found early on that ended up being a very solid hybrid and um, i ended up not taking him to monolith in this run but he survived till i stopped playing the campaign around today 200 so i thought he was gonna die but he ended up doing well getting a lot of kills and he was very good in this fight next i highly recommend having at least two tanks um, in this fight, I had a Battle Forge tank and a very good Nimble tank. Um, I like Lone Wolf on my tanks. It kind of gives you some flexibility. And in this fight, they might be three tiles away. So you can get some nice bonus there. I think they're very good early on. Um, to, when we go through the strategy, it, it helps you manipulate where the enemies are going to be. And then they can act as a nice wall and catch a lot of enemies that get resurrected to kind of keep the pressure off your damage dealers and your uh, jar commandos if you will so you can deal with the lore master you can deal with skulls you can deal with all that that nonsense in the middle of the fight and the tanks can kind of safeguard you against um the mass res strategies that the lore master is going to throw at you i like to have two i highly recommend two if you can have them both battleforge great nimble will be fine the extra armor in this fight you will notice um, because the skulls will wear your armor down but they do have a shield so they do have a chance to block a skull explosion which is nice 
Next are the nice to haves. You're gonna have damage guys, whether they're duelists or two handers. Um, I had a dodge quick hands guy, just a standard tempo build. You see, it's kind of a meta build. It's very strong. It's got fearsome. He's very good against other fights, but I brought him. Um, I had a dodge, sort of dodge quick hands flail dude. Um, he's a bit of a meme, bit of a practice hero. He rolled really well. Um, he had a maimed foot. But uh, he was good against shielded guys, so I brought him in this fight. Um, but you really, the nice to have is a battle forged carry. I got lucky and had two. I got pretty good famed item rolls, so I always had two sets of famed uh, forged armor for this fight. But you're guaranteed to have the Ejirok on your map somewhere. So if you find that, you can guarantee yourself a good forge set. Um, you can give one to a forge tank and one to uh, a damage carry. Whether that's a duelist or a two-hander, you, you do want some hard-hitting guys that have some staying power. Because your nimble guys might die. In my um, my lost poachers run, I lost two guys. I lost my nimble tank kind of right at the end, which sucked. And then I lost a dodge quick-hand guy to bleed. But So they, they can die in this fight the battle forge guys will obviously stick around however if you take this earlier you know a nice to have is at least one battle forge damaged carry um and to kind of piggyback off the tank i mentioned it if you have a monolith style tank and one of those two so like you have the lone wolf it allows you to do some things in this fight um to kind of negate the effectiveness of that mass resurrection. Um, both of these guys had Lone Wolf in mind, so they both could kind of fill that role. Uh, I recommend it. A nice to have is a banner with bags and belts. I mentioned that as well. My my banner for this didn't, but if you can squeeze bags and belts on, even if you just have your classic um, banner or quick hands to a whip, if you just give them bags and belts, you have some options. You can bring some grenades, bring some nets, do some different things to just help support your guys. All right, on to the luxury perks. Axe mastery is kind of nice to have if you can fit it into a guy. Uh, the If you get a low roll, as I would define it, and you have a bunch of shield legionaries, or sorry, honor guards, they'll slow you down enough. And you don't want to get into the later rounds. Um, you want to kind of get ahead of the the clock, if you will. So having one guy with axe mastery and maybe a famed, you know, axe or something, it allows you to, if you need it, if you have a really stubborn honor guard that you keep low rolling on, we've all had that, you can crack his shield um, to just get him dead so you can move on to damaging the lore master or controlling some of the other enemies. So kind of a luxury, not a, not a need, but it is it is noticeable. Um, the Honor Guard do have Shield Mastery, so it takes a couple whacks to get through it normally. Uh, having Recover is a nice to have. I wouldn't say it's essential. I would say Pathfinder is essential. I put Pathfinder on basically all my guys. Um, and you'll see in the raw footage, the vast majority of them have Pathfinder. But Recover is cool um, if you have like, a duelist or a cleaver guy. I have it on my tanks and my cleaver guy in this fight. Um, and lastly is backstabber. I didn't run it with a guy, but if you have a guy that's a decent early, maybe through the first crisis mid game guy, and you have an extra perk, you're not playing on keeping them. He, you, you might die later, whatever. And you're planning to take this fight, give him backstabber. It'll help against the lore master. Cause you will get a bunch of guys surrounding him. And this will negate his underdog and give you some extra plus five percent for that surround bonus. And it just helps get him down a little quicker. As I said, you will notice the 15 melee defense. It's noticeable when you have a couple guys all swinging on him with his damage reduction. It just might help get him lower quicker. And ultimately, when it comes time to kill him, it makes that a little bit more of a sure thing if that brother's in the right spot and still alive. Items and preparation for the fight. Same thing, I'm gonna do highly recommended, nice to have, and luxury. I don't think there's any necessarily uh, must, must-haves because I do think you can do this in different ways. 
Um, but for me, highly recommended. Obviously, you want the undead trophy. I would put this on your your best uh, damage dealer. Um, I gave it to one of my Battle Forge damage carries. You can put it on a tank if you want. You could put it on one of your uh, jar commandos, if you will, um, if you want to make sure he's good to go uh, and never gets worn down by morale out and about. Um, you know, it's up to you. I would try to have your guys in a good mood to increase your chance of starting with confident. And the, the footage, obviously, they're anatomists. They can't have confident. But having some of your guys with confident will start the fight um, easier. You're just going to go through that initial wave. You're going to have that buffer of going from confident to normal versus normal to any of the wavering, breaking, etc. It's a great buff. Um, dogs. I like to have 10. Um, I have my banner with his sash. I have somebody with the undead trophy and then everyone else carries a dog. Um, the dogs are fantastic in this fight. My poacher run, I didn't prep properly. My goal for that run was to do it before day 100. I forgot to buy a dog, so I think I only had four. Um, the anatomist footage, I had 10 uh, in this fight. They're great to unleash at different points um, or just go all out at certain points with all the dogs you have left. Um, nice to have. I think that the Lionheart potions are great to have by which ones you can find um, when you're starting to think about it. I For this, I just ran around the desert and bought all the potions that they had just right before the fight. But, you know, if you're diligent about it, you can get a couple of Lionhearts. Um, the next one is Second Winds. Um, I would grab as many of these as you can and um, and do it. You can also get some value out of the cat potion if you want. Um, the enemies in this are pretty slow, but you can speed up some slow guys if you want. It's just nice to always make sure you're going ahead of the honor guard. So definitely prioritize uh, Lionheart second win, and if you have the cash for it, a cat potion or two. Uh, barb throwing axes. This one's obvious. With Throwing Mastery and Duelist, they do a lot of damage to Ancient Undead. They also one-shot Jars. If you don't have Barb, Throwing Axes, regular Throwing Axes will also one-shot Jars. They're not as great against Ancient Undead, but still decent enough with Throwing Mastery and Duelist. But um, I would put the, the Barb Throwing Axes as an absolute nice to have. Um, Goblin Pikes, I like to have two on my two um, Jar Commandos that go deep into the map. The Goblin Pike lets me skip Polearm. The stuff that they're going to be stabbing with the Goblin Pike has no hit points, really. It's a one-shot on a Jar, one-shot on a Ghost, one-shot on a Skull. Um, and for 5 AP, it's great. And they're also pretty light, so you'll have a bigger fatigue pool. It's a long fight, so any extra fatigue you can squeeze out before the fight is nice. Um, and then finally, we have a good use for the Nomad Sling. I like to take two on those uh, jar commandos that go deep into the, uh, the map. These things are fantastic for taking out skulls. One of the best ways to get confident or your morale back on those guys that are far, far away from your banner is to pop some skulls and jars, um, which they're going to be killing anyway. It'll get their morale back up. They'll start feeling good about themselves. You know, and um, the slings are also a great contingency plan. If you're out of ammo and there's like one jar left and you just chuck stones at it, it takes two or three stones to kill it. But, hey, you know, they're free. Essentially, like the, the fights you get them from are easy um, and they have infinite ammo. The nice are the luxury. The next are the luxuries. Um, I have basically all the throwables, nets, grenades and holy water uh i had a monk so i had a holy water for this fight i didn't use the three holy water from the legendary location uh it was nice to just get that on in honor guard with the shield uh the grenades the day's grenade is good because you'll get big clumps of ancient undead that are gonna swing a bunch at a single guy with their pole arms uh you can use it late in the fight for a mass res uh, to just put dazed on a lot of enemies. You can use it early um, to really like churn through things. The smoke pot is nice to save. You're going to get your positioning screwed up by the lightning and the mass resurrection and the skulls. 
So sometimes it's a good save or a good contingency plan to have a smoke pot to move some guys around if you have to. Next on the luxury is the Ezerok quest item. So the Ezerok armor and the cleaver that you'll get from the Icy Cave. Definitely a luxury, I think. You don't need them, although they're going to be on every map. And depending on how you want to play, um, if you want to just rush the library, you might not have time to explore to find them. But I usually try to find them before. I usually start hunting for Ezerok around day 70. Um, as soon as I'm able to take the cave fight, so once I have a good brother at a level 11. Uh, but having those in this fight will make a difference. So that kind of concludes my items. And uh, go slings. This is where they can actually shine. Last section is the strategy. If you stuck with me this long, thank you. Uh, if you just skipped the timestamp, all right, let's get some. Um, part one of this fight is prioritizing the treasure hunters. You're going to start on the edge. You're going to start on a little bit of an elevated position. The positions of the enemies are going to be a little random. I like to see where the treasure hunters are and then come up with a plan to kill them ASAP. I want to minimize the damage these things can do because they can do a sneaky amount of damage right off the bat and that's not good. This fight's going to go, you know, the to 12 to 20 plus rounds depending upon how lucky and good you are so having a plan for these guys is is important as i said before these guys don't have steel brow so this is a chance where you can take advantage of some headshots if you have a team set up for that kill these guys and if you can safely pick up their weapons um, they will get up once like a standard zombie this is separate from his mass res, so if you kill it, you pick up his weapon, he'll spawn with just his bite. You could leave him alive at this point. Uh, they still have a lot of attack, so it'll be hard to get out of zone with them. And they will hit you with their bite, which can be annoying. I just recommend killing them twice, but pick up their good weapons and, um, and move on. The second phase of this fight for me is to kind of... Figure out where the honor guard are. Well, you already figured it out. They're going to be moving towards you at this point. We're going to be on turn two to three. So you're going to have a plan to kill the honor guard. Some of the honor guard are going to move to the lore master. So that's nice. You can ignore them. They're almost irrelevant for this part of the fight. I would kill the other honor guard out of reach of any of the lore keeper's bodyguards. So Try to avoid the reach of the pole arms. This is where you can be patient. You've got the treasure hunters dealt with. They're dead. Um, now you just clean up the honor guard. You're going to want to be deliberate at this point because you don't want to take too long. This is where cracking through some shields can be nice if you have the fatigue and you're, and you're in good shape. The lore keeper is going to be hitting you with miasma. It's going to be hitting you with fear. Try to keep your health up and your morale up. As soon as all of the honor guard are kind of committed so they're closer to your main brothers, at this point I've already started to move my, um, my what you call my jar commandos along the top edge of the map. I want to keep them out of range of the, uh, the honor guard. I don't want them to start chasing the honor, or my, my jar commandos. So I'm peeling these guys off. I'm starting to look for jars um, at this stage as well. You know, this stage should take you up to around turn five. <clears throat> so step three I have is keep track of your jar locations. Also keep track of your your lore keeper because he's going to run around. Um, he's going to be a jerk. He's kind of hard to lock down. It's kind of by design. But if you start killing the guys that aren't his bodyguards, he'll just chill out and throw spells at you. I literally just take a blank piece of paper. I draw a square. I'm going to put it up on the screen. And I just make some notes on where the ghosts spawn. I'll just do that with a G. And then where my jars are. I just do a J comma, either J comma G for ground, J comma R for raise. Do whatever makes sense for you. It just gives you a good idea of where the jars are. If you move away from the jar and no one can see it, it won't appear. But if you kill the jar, you'll be able to see the crumpled dead jar on the screen, even if you, you don't have a guy physically able to see it. So that is something to note. 
but at this point I haven't killed any jars yet. Um, at this point I also am trying not to use dogs because I don't want to start killing jars yet. The dogs I would say use as an emergency as in like an honor guard is able to zone one of your um, your jar commandos. But otherwise try to keep the dogs, keep them on their leash. All right, so the next one, you're around turn six and seven. Be ready for the skulls. The skulls are going to start being spawned by the lore keeper. No need to panic, but it, it'll be nice to have some of your guys that have quick hands and reach weapons. Maybe have them on the edge while you have guys like tanks and your, your two-hander damage that don't have reach weapons. Keep them more committed to the actual enemies. Here's where I start to look for little turns to rest also like because you'll have a bunch of the honor guard dead. Um, also plan where these engagements are going to happen. So if you can, this is where I talked about my tanks being useful is I'll try to draw in a bunch of honor guards that aren't the bodyguards to them. So they're clumps and I try to have them spaced out so that when their corpses are down, um, they're not all in one big group. If you have your guys all in one big group, they're going to respawn in all one big group, which can be fine. It's just more of a preference thing. But I like to kind of have the dead honor guards spread out a little bit. And um, at this point, I'm leaving my tanks near the corpses. I don't really need them anymore. Maybe I'll bring one to deal with the, the lore keeper's bodyguards, but we're going to get to that. But start being ready for the skulls. So at this point, turn six through about turn 10, you know, I'm finishing up, moving my guys in position, getting ready to assault uh, the Lord Keeper and his bodyguards. Then you can get some turns where you can just have them do nothing and recover, you know, some stam naturally. Keep your morale up, be proactive with your banner, wait and respond to the Lord Keeper's fears, kind of stuff like this. Also, if he's fearing your... Um, your jar killers this is a good time where you can try to maneuver your exploring towards some skulls to try to kill the skulls and get some morale back if that's a problem the uh the next one is zoning the lich and killing the um the rest of his bodyguards so this is where that bodyguard ai you can kind of take advantage of in small doses you're going to have a mix a hodgepodge of different honor guards around them some with pole arms some with shields the shield guys will try to bash you away from the lore keeper so you could get creative with your positioning um to threaten the lore keeper and then they'll waste a shield bash on the guy maybe they'll even bash him towards an honor guard you want to kill anyway they'll rotate the honor guard so if you have a pole pole arm guy that's hiding between so if you have your brother then the honor or the the lore keeper then the honor guard and you want to kill that pole arm guy because it's a threat. You can threaten the honor guard by moving next, or the lore keeper, sorry, by moving next to him. And the pole guy, arm guy will swap with the lore keeper. So pay attention to the turn order. Um, and you can have these pole arm guys move into your brother if you're kind of sneaky enough. It won't happen every fight, but look for these opportunities. These are areas where you can be efficient with your fatigue. At this point, you want to zone the Lich and kill his bodyguards. You can start whittling them down too because this is going to take a while. So the next one I have is you're going to reposition guys uh, for the mass res. So this is where I'll move tanks back to those clumps of bodies. I might move, if I have jars near the front of the fight, I might move one of my melee guys to that singular jar. Um, I will also peel off my other two throwers that I used to churn through the Ancient Undead at this point to some of the jars more in the middle of the map. I'm constantly zooming out, looking at my notes on where the jars are, and just kind of getting a feel for when I need to move guys around. This is going to be start, you know, around turn 10. Um, you know, at this point, if you want to go watch the footage, you can. But this is kind of a feel. So as you're starting to really win against the honor guards don't overcommit. you know you want about half your team at this point committed 
to finishing off and weakening the lich but the other half should be out getting ready for a mass res and locating jars and getting in position for jars um the next step is you're going to want to start weakening the lich this can be parallel to six i haven't really been numbering them but maybe i'll number them in the video so this will take a while he's got 15 defense and he's got all this damage reduction he's got a big health pool start whittling him down but make sure not to kill him it's nice if you have your heavy hitting two-handed mace or two-handed hammer he can be dazed he can be staggered he cannot be stunned so once he gets low it's i like to have you know some some of these guys because it's going to start, you're going to maybe start killing jars at this point. You might be nearing turn 15, turn 16, turn 12. Some of these benchmarks when you start summoning ghosts, mass resurrections. So it's going to speed up. So if you can be weakening them while inflicting dazed and stagger on them, you'll notice the difference because it'll really slow him down. He has decent initiative for an undead. Um, now at this point, Things are starting to escalate. You're getting mass resurrections. You're getting ghosts, maybe. Um, I usually am in this position around turn 10 to 12, is I'll have my deep jar hunters. They'll be next to two jars, and I'll have a plan to usually kill four jars in a turn or two quickly if things go well. At this point, you know, I'll, I'll start killing the jars in the back. Uh, and moving these guys aggressively to the next ones. You want to, this is where it's time. You're going to be, it's it's going to escalate anyway, so start killing the jars. Um, maybe you drop a dog next to a jar and then throw at another two. This is where Berserk can come in handy. Um, keep these guys alive and start start cracking jars. If you have a melee guy next to a jar, smack that and get your damage guy back to where shit's going to, mass resurrect um start executing your plan as i said i have a, a piece of paper so if you have ground jars that are close to your melee fighters kill those first wait with your ranged guys so they go later in the round because there's a chance the lore keeper might switch whether they're up or down so if i have 10 jars on the map say i have one on the ground i kill that with the melee guy my hybrids will have higher initiative, so I'll wait with them. Everything will go, and then I will kill some jars with them with the ranged. Because I don't care if they're on the up or down. It doesn't matter to them, because I'm using throwing axes. Number nine, or part nine, is you're going to have ghosts start to spawn once you're killing jars and you're in the turn 15-ish category. So keep track of those. I personally do not prioritize these until the lore keeper's dead unless they are right there this is where you might tactically start deploying a dog or two the dogs will deal with skulls they're a little unpredictable but they might also go after the ghosts they might also distract the ghosts but start to keep track of them as they spawn they might spawn out of your line of sight which can be a pain in the butt but if you see them mark them down at this point is um you know my second to last phase is kill the lich as soon as all the 10 jars are dead kill the lich prioritize him being dead you're gonna have lightning going on you're gonna have a bunch of stuff it's going to start to snowball kill the lich you might have some guys die at this point um things are going to be resurrecting you're going to get uh, the skulls blowing up do not kill him before that 10th jar. This is something you're going to want to plan. It's going to be, this is where I was talking about it becoming a sprint. Those two turns where you're on jar 9, 10, and then you have to kill the lich. Um, it's going to be very important. So this is where a net can come in handy. Reduce that melee defense of him or your backstabber if he's still alive and you have one. Make sure you kill him as soon as that 10th jar is dead. And lastly, who let the dogs out? That's right, you let the dogs out. Let's slip the dogs of war, baby. This is it, the final stretch. Let the dogs loose any dog you have left after that lich is dead, just drop it. They will run around, they will distract the resurrected guys, they will, they will eat skulls, um, they will run after the ghosts. The ghosts 
are much easier to handle because they can only cast one spell. And they're probably going to throw lightning at you, which honestly, the less guys that are alive, it's easier to dodge. Kill those, kill the glow, kill the ghosts, clean up, and you're done. Hopefully you get there and you had a great time and everyone's alive. Um, if not, um, well, that sucks. That's how Battle Brothers goes. You know, I hope you had fun and uh, thanks for sticking with me through this guide and hope you learned something. Throw anything down in comments. I'll try to respond. I'll also do a video of the raw footage and I will color commentate on it so you can get some of the nuance if you're into that sort of thing. And uh, have a great day. Good luck.